to extend my talk from the main stage to talk to you about some of the methodologies that myself and other colleagues use in order to really um, create futures based on all of the exponential technologies that you're about to hear about um, over the next couple days. Now, in order to help us and yourselves to create uh, companies and opportunities that really leverage these types of technologies. Technologies that are still being developed, that are not fully to their complete state, as well as for futures that are going to be radically different than the ones we are to seeing today, thanks to that accelerating pace of change that I mentioned. We need a different type of framework to be able to create solutions for that world. And for that reason, my, my colleague Christine Kelly, Robert Suarez, and I have created a, a design framework known as Design for Exponentials. Now, in that is the sci-fi methodology. And I'm going to explain to you the overarching, um, the overarching theory behind this. And then we're going to try a little bit of sci-fi thinking ourselves, OK? So to get started, uh, Design for Exponentials, as I said, is made to help organizations such as yourself to reimagine the future and figure out what you need to start building right now to be the disruptor and not be disrupted. Yeah? So um, this clicker is not working. Ah, now it's working too well. Okay. <laughs> so as I, as I may have mentioned, technology in itself is not going to be the disruption. You can't just take an AI and apply it to whatever you're doing and say, oh, done. I'm done. Because really you're just continuing. You're sustaining what you already have. And that just is setting you up for failure. Somebody is going to come along and do it very differently than you are now. So instead, uh, tech disruptors, what they do is they solve a problem that we haven't been able to solve until now. Now, that is how traditionally um, technol or how disruption has happened. And so the most important part of any process is really understanding what is the right problem to solve. It can't be the one that you have been trying to solve for your entire company's lifespan. You have to pick a new problem, something that is really something you never thought you could solve before. Right. Um, and, and you'll find that this is the methodology that has been used for, for generations to really come up with those wild and crazy ideas, things that people have traditionally said, no, we'll never be able to solve it. So you have to spend a lot of time really investigating what is the actual problem, not what is the business problem. And I think this is the biggest challenge for us as business owners is how do we solve the actual problem, not the one that we are creating for ourselves. It's not about making more money. It's not about um, creating a better um, advertisement so people buy this. It's what real problem are you solving for the human being that is hiring your product to solve their problems, okay? And so, <laughs> don't ask your customers. You cannot ask them, what should I be doing differently? Because just like you, when they hear a novel idea, their knee-jerk reaction is to say no, right? Until you can demonstrate that this is something they need, they're going to tell you no. And that's because it's unfamiliar to them. It doesn't exist in the marketplace. And so when they hear about it, they're like, I don't see how that's even valuable, no. And usually you're working with a group of people. If you're going to really be the disruptor, you have to solve a problem not for your existing customers, but for a new set of customers, okay? That's what IBM did when they invented the PC. They noticed that they were selling lots of mainframe computers, but only to a select number of people who could afford it and who needed that computing power. And there was only so many of people like that in the world. So instead what they did is they said, well, what if we made an affordable computer that everybody could use? What then, right? Which created this ginormous global market for them almost instantly. And that's what you're trying to do is you're not trying to solve it for the existing marketplace. You're trying to create an entirely new one. 
And the problem is, is that you're also not going to find it sitting in your boardroom. <laughs> you can't sit in your boardroom and think your way into disruption. It's not going to happen. You have to actively look for a downward market. You have to find this bigger, larger market that exists underneath the existing marketplace. Now, here are three factors that prevent companies from really making that kind of movement down market like they need to to be the disruptor. The first is that we get addicted to the money that is happening at the top end of our market. <laughs> And we built our companies on the guarantee that we're going to continue making that money. Two is that all of our customers and our competitors are chasing that end of the market. So then we start to think, OK, I have to play there. Otherwise, I'm going to fail. Okay? And then the third is it's very difficult to cut costs in order to be able to play in this new marketplace. If you have a company that's entirely geared around industry 2.0, that means you have a lot of human beings and a lot of investments that make it so that you become addicted to that money. And now you're saying, oh, I'm going to get rid of that money. What happens to all those people? And that's really terrifying. Impact can help. So you've heard us mention global grand challenges. Our global grand challenges that we work on at SU are real human problems. We have 13 of them. They include things like poverty, hunger, health, education, um, all sorts of things like this. Real problems that the UN has designated as being critical for the world to solve. And when you work on the problem, what happens is that, oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, well, there we go, thank you. So, so um, now you're working on real problems, not market problems, not um, problems that you've been able to advertise your consumers into believing are a problem, but actual real human being problems. And in doing that, um, what happens is, is that you start to invite new people to the table. And this is probably the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself. Normally, when we're trying to do our work, we're talking to experts in our field or in their field. And they tend to be the same people with the same types of education, with the same types of ideas. And instead, when you work on impact, you invite people to the table that are normally not included in your conversation. This naturally creates a new perspective, a new way of thinking that you haven't thought of before, and that can open up huge new opportunities. The other thing about these sort of impact problems is that they aren't profitable necessarily, which means none of your competitors are working on them, right? They say, oh yeah, we could do that, but there's no money in it. Well, that's what they think. That's good for them. Good. You let them think that. You know differently now that you're hearing about this because when you work on those problems, what happens is you naturally open up new markets. So this is a project that was created by a company called Icon. Now Icon went and they made one of those ginormous 3D printers that Andre was talking about. And they were able to print a house, not in months, but in 24 hours, okay? And their reason for doing this is that they were trying to help people in poverty to be, have owner, home ownership, and also to have homes that could be more disaster resilient, okay? And so what they did was they, they figured out a way to 3D print this house in 24 hours, which dropped the price from a uh, couple hundred, uh, 100,000 US to about $1,000 US. And what that means is that now people around the world who never, ever, ever imagined they could own a home can buy a home. So they're already opening up a multi-million dollar industry because they have opened up communities in places like Mexico, in um, poverty areas in Africa, in Asia, that people have been living in cardboard shacks or tin shacks who can now afford these very stable homes. Right? And so now they, just like IBM, now they can sell a home to a lot more people at a low, lower price point but it makes them a lot more money. And then they can bring it back to the existing market and make more money there too. 
right? Oh, geez. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the other thing is that when you work on uh, low profit scenarios, you end up developing a lot of IP that is incredibly valuable, okay? Because nobody else, none of your competitors are there. So you are able to build things, create patents, create ideas that nobody else can use. This is um, a project by SRI, that's Stanford Research Institute. They're the people that brought you Siri, okay, the phone on your uh, iPhone. All right, so back in the 80s, they were helping deaf people to communicate via phone lines. And so what they did was they created a tool to allow people to send data packets over phone lines. This is what allowed deaf people to do something called teletype. So they would type communications that would be sent to somebody on the other end. Now, in 1994, when we decided that we wanted to commercialize the internet, nobody knew how to do that. But SRI did. They said, oh, we have a way to send data over phone lines. It's called the acoustic modem. So those of you who remember dial-up, although I don't think anybody in here is old enough, <laughs> this is the thing that went okay? And they made millions, billions of dollars because they had this IP that they built by working on something that was no profit. And it ended up creating a massive revolution in the way we use the technology in the world. This leads to untapped funding. There's lots of money out there available for people to work on these impact problems that's not being used because people think there's no money in it. So they don't even bother to try. And so you can get funding for your ideas. In addition to that, you create a purpose. Now, purpose is incredibly important as an organization. I know that the reason I came to SU was because they were working on global grand challenges. And for me, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanna make life better for people around the world. When you work on impact, what happens is that people bring their passion to working for you, which means that they are more willing to work hard. They're more invested in the company's success. And that is incredibly valuable when we start talking about that 2.4 million uh, skill gap. You need people with skills that want to work for you rather than your competitor. So if you have a reason for being, they're going to come to you and they're going to be willing to work for you much harder than they will somebody else. The other thing that's really important is that these types of narratives, when you can build a narrative around what you're doing, it can move mountains. This is an English saying. Um, but what I mean by that is that narratives such as advertising, for example, right? Advertising sells laundry detergent. I buy this one rather than that one because I like that commercial. It really has nothing to do with the quality of the thing, right? It has to do with the narrative behind it. We also see that this is what causes politics to happen. This is what causes everything to happen is if there's a narrative. Now what narratives do is that they make things that seem crazy more familiar, which makes it easier for you to go along with the idea, okay? And so that's why we write science fiction. Because it helps us to project into the future. If we can write a story about what future we wanna see, we can recruit all of you to come and help us to build that future as opposed to if I'm talking to you in these abstract ways about ideas, right? So narratives are really important, and especially when we talk about the future. Ooh, geez, sorry. So you heard Alan Kay talking about the best way to predict the future is to actively go out and create it. And this is the easiest way for you to go out and create the future, is to write a story about what you want to see in the world, because that's going to draft people to come with you and help you do that. Now. Science fiction has constantly influenced science fact back and forth again over and over, right? It started, one of the most famous examples is Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek communicator, this one here. And for those of you who aren't Star Trek fans, you really need to be. Um, <laughs> so Gene Roddenberry created this, and 
Martin Cooper at Motorola was so inspired by that that he wanted that. He wanted it so bad that he went out and he created mobile tele 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 telephony. That's the word. Mobile phones. Anyways, and in fact, it's no coincidence that Motorola's best-selling product is called the Star Tech. So we have the Star Tech or the Star Trek and the Star Tech communicator, right? Right. And so this is exactly how it happens: is that sci-fi writers they read some science fact and they get excited, they get inspired, they write some story which normalizes the idea and causes nerds like myself to go out and try to make that into reality. And then I make it into reality and then some sci-fi writer reads it, gets excited, writes a story, and I get all excited again and I have to go make some new facts, right? And it happens over and over again. It happened to uh, Steve Jobs when he saw Space Odyssey 2001 and met Hal. He was so excited about Hal that he spent decades to develop Siri. There's a reason why Siri is a woman. It's because he didn't want people to be scared that Hal was going to happen. For those of you who don't know, Hal was a very <laughs> crazy computer. But it was a talking computer. Okay. Uh, every new member of Oculus Rift, the VR glasses from Facebook, every new member there is handed a copy of a book called Ready Player One that describes a future in which we all live in VR. Okay. And they're told, go make this. This is what we're building. Okay? Um, and they are. Yeah. Again, with the Star Trek. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a Trekkie. Anyway, so this is Dr. McCoy. And he had this fancy little doohickey here called a tricorder. And what he would do is he'd walk up to a patient and it would go, -de 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 -de. and he could tell what was wrong with the person. Well, Peter Diamantis and the X Prize, along with Qualcomm, created an X uh, tricorder prize. And we had um, many different entrants, but this one won. This is called Dexter. And it goes, -de 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 -de, and it diagnoses seven common household diseases. Right? So we saw what we wanted, and then we put a money behind it and got people to go and build it. And that's why we created a methodology called Sci-Fi DI. What that means, stands for is Sci-Fi Design Intelligence. I don't know where the DI part came from, but what it means is that what we do is we spend the first um, couple days really invested in science fact in the way that you're going to do over the next couple days. You're going to hear all kinds of facts and figures from all scientists and engineers. It's going to be too much information, trust me. And you're going to be inspired. You're going to start to think about what's possible. Yeah. And then what we do, um, ooh, I seem to have skipped some slides there. Oh, okay. Hey, there we go. Then we go off and we write science fiction. Normally what we do is we bring along some comic book writers and some comic book artists and we bring some um, sci-fi writers and some movie writers, whatever, and we get them to start thinking wild and crazy thought, which helps us to start to think wild and crazy thoughts. And then we, um, wow, this is really strangely out of order. Uh, Okay, well, then we go and we start writing these stories. And um, I don't know what's going on with my slide deck, so I'm just going to talk. Okay, so what happens is they go and write this. So now we're all involved in the act of writing it, which allows our f brains to go loose, right? Because nobody can tell you that it's wrong if you're writing science fiction. It's creative act. I'm allowed to think crazy ideas. Nobody can tell me no. I can think whatever I want to think, right? And I can bring all my colleagues along to think wild and crazy thoughts. It's a safe place for us to be crazy. And like I said, crazy ideas change the world. So this allows us to do this. And then when we go to share the ideas with other people, because we've written it into a narrative, into a story, and usually we make comic books out of it, that allows those people the freedom to go along on the ride with us, to listen to the wild and crazy ideas. Because it's a story. They can't say it's wrong, it's a story. And then what happens is just like with the advertising, it makes it more familiar. It makes it more normal, so that when we really do want to talk to them about turning it into science fact, their first reaction isn't no, it's, oh, I've heard something like that before. Okay, maybe. 
And that gets them a little closer to buying into what we're trying to do. The other thing is it eliminates ambiguity. So I want you all to sit here right now and picture a robot, okay? You have a picture in your head of a robot? Okay, how many of you are picturing an industrial robot? Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, a couple of people, okay. You just don't raise your hand very high here, I got it, okay. How many of you are picturing a humanoid robot? A lot, okay, good. How many of you are picturing a vacuum? Huh? Fun, okay, good. Two, so here's the thing, right? If I'm telling you I wanna build a robot, that is going to be your caretaker, if you were picturing a humanoid, you might be like, okay. If you were picturing a vacuum, you might be like, what? If you were picturing an industrial robot, you were like, no. And so now we're arguing about the picture that you see in your head versus the picture I see in my head, and we're not having the same conversation at all, right? And so when we draw a picture of the robot, by the way, this is the robot, now I'm saying, I want to build this thing. And you're saying, oh, okay, I see what you want to build. And now we can talk about this instead of whatever you're picturing in your head versus whatever I have in mind. Okay? And then it helps us to figure out what we want to build right now. Now, you're going to hear from Jason Dunn um, later today about Made in Space. He is brilliant. He and uh, you're going to also hear from Dara. Dara is also part of this Made in Space team. And what they did is that they wanted to colonize Mars. Okay. And the way to do that, they realize, is that they have to build houses on Mars in order for us to live on Mars. Okay. So then they came back to the United or er, to to Earth. And they were like, okay, what do we need to do? Okay, so right now, in order to build a structure on Earth, or on, the, on Mars, we have to build it here on Earth with Earth materials and Earth gravity, okay? And then it has to be able to break apart to be shipped from where we're manufacturing it to the launch pad. Now, that means it has to fit on a truck. Does anybody know what the size of a truck is based on? two-horse-drawn carriage. That's what the size of trucks and cars are based on, is a two-horse-drawn carriage. So here we are, we're gonna go colonize Mars, and we have to fit it into a two-horse-drawn carriage size, some technology that we don't even use today, right? So they thought, okay, that's ridiculous. And then on top of it, it has to be lightweight enough to be able to be launched into space, which is another really complicated thing. So instead of doing that, what they realized is that they could just, um, 3D print in, at Mars, and now they can use the materials that they find on Mars as part of their raw materials for printing. So then they went off and they said, okay, well, if that's the future we want, right, in 15 years, what do we have to start with today? What's the first step to get there? It's a 3D printer on the International Space Station. Now, I'm not going to steal his thunder. You're going to have to stay tuned for more information from Jason, but he's going to tell you about how they did this and how it has already revolutionized how we think about the supply chain to outer space. Because now, instead of having to wait six months for a product that they're missing, the astronauts wait two hours, and they get their product, OK? The last step, or the third step, is making. So this is a really important thing. A lot of times when you hear in the, uh, the phrase from Silicon Valley, we hear this phrase that you need to uh, fail fast. And what most people think when they hear the words fail fast is to kill it fast. It's kind of like what I was talking about, right? When it gets to that 15 day part, it's not working, let's kill it. That is not what we mean. <laughs> that is not what we mean at all. What we mean is to make little experiments that are low cost, that are low effort, that allow you to learn as fast as humanly possible. This methodology has been championed by a man named Tom Chi, who used to be head of Google Prototyping X, uh, now known as ABC's X. And um, he, he put this to work when he, they were creating the Google Glass. Now, there's a famous story of Google Glass where they were trying to determine the color of the display. Scientifically, 
they realized that red is the least taxing on the human brain. And so there was one whole camp of people there that were insistent that the display had to be red. There is another group that thought it should be a different color, and another person that thought it should be full color. And they were arguing completely because it was all abstract. It was just what they saw in their heads, right? And they had to make a decision because they had to invest in the display technology. Now, this is a multi-million dollar decision, and they had no data to make the decision, right? So what Tom and his team did is said, wait, 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 let's not make a mistake. So they went, they got, some chopsticks, a binder clip, and they bent a clothes hanger, and they put a little transparency there with a little tiny projector, and they tried different color displays. And guess what? The team that really insisted it had to be red, when they saw the red display, said, oh, this is terrible. Right? And so they very, very quickly decided, no, 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 it has to be a full color display. Okay, so they got to the answer super quick with no cost. And they continued to do that throughout the entire process. And they still do. So making, actively making in this sort of way, instead of sitting at your computer, if you're actively up and you're physically trying to make, what happens is you engage more of your brain. Because we as human beings, we embody our brain, our mind. Our mind is embodied. We think with our fingers, we think with our toes. And the more you engage the body, the better your thoughts. For example, have you been stuck on a problem? And then you go for a walk, and suddenly you find the answer. That's because you're engaging your body into the thought process, which makes you a much more effective thinker. Okay, so when you make in this way, you're engaging your brain in a different way. The other thing is that you're changing your tools. Now, I, I will tell you, working at Microsoft on the HoloLens, um, I was one of the principal designers on that, and um, what happened is that we had a bunch of Microsoft engineers sitting there and when they were trying to think of what it should be like, they were using their 2D computers uh, to try to think through things, which meant we got 2D interfaces floating out in space on a, holo a hologram, right, instead of dimensional things. Because we were using this outdated piece of technology to try to imagine the future. We were stuck. We kept thinking in that same paradigm. We couldn't break out of it. So instead, what I did was I, um, I got these, this clear mylar and some paper, and I created these dioramas. And now, when I went to go to explain to the engineers what I wanted to create, instead of like showing them a PowerPoint, right? PowerPoint makes you stupid. <laughs> instead, I made these things. And they were like, oh, that's what you want? Oh, yeah, we can build that. And we were able to create an entire different way because we broke the tools that we were used to using. The other thing about making is that we can be uh, inspired. So this is a car that I helped um, Toyota develop. It's called the iCar. And um, once we had developed it, we realized we needed a way to tell other uh, Toyota people about it, but also the world about it. So we could explain how radically different we thought of this thing. So we created a fully functional, um, uh, f real life prototype, kind of like the one that's sitting out there. Um, and then we allowed people to get inside of it and experience different things. And that inspired us to think even more differently about what was possible. Okay, the last piece in D4X is launch. Now, um, this seems like, oh yeah, of course you're gonna start your company, but this is a really different way to do it. First of all, like I said, the corporate structure tends to mirror whatever service and product you're used to start developing, and that makes you very rigid. It makes it hard for you to uh, turn. So instead, what you wanna do, um, and, that, and that actually locks you into certain ways of, th of, of, of thinking. So what happens with innovation is you usually innovate within your silo. Like we, we're, we're, in, we're in the banking group and then the banking group, we're trying to think of how to do banking better. We're not thinking about how to revolutionize the consumer engagement process because that would require talking across multiple silos. We're just talking about, we usually only innovate in our one thing. Oh, I'm in material science. I'm only going to think about new ways of materials, not new ways of manufacturing using those materials. So that's the danger there. So instead, you wanna be nimble. 
You want to eliminate all of those things. You want to think radically different so that you can create an entirely new structure based on the idea. Now, if you're internal to a corporation, this is difficult. And that's why we have a lot of companies that create these little external teams that are allowed to play outside of the rules of the game of the bigger corporation, okay? And so that's where you get these incubators coming from. Oop. And that allows you to really redefine the metrics and redefine incentives. Because if I'm getting, um, my bonuses are tied to making better profits within the organization, I'm not gonna take a risk. But if you incentivize me for the more risks I take, then I'm going to be much more risky. So you have to come up with a whole different incentive structure if you want an entirely different business to come out of it, okay? So in doing this, what you're doing is you're constantly shifting your perspective. You're looking at the problem from different angles, and that naturally lends your eye to entirely new solutions that you would never have thought of before. So, that is the premise behind Design for action Exponentials. Now, in the immortal world, words of Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. We're gonna try just a really quick version of the sci-fi methodology. So what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna pick somebody. Um, you can do it yourself, but it's more fun if you have a friend. Um, and you're gonna pick somebody in the audience and you're going to um, spend a little time trying out sci-fi DI. There's some sticky notes and some pencils that we can pass out or you can use your own paper, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna pose to you a couple questions, okay? You guys all ready? You have your partner? You have your friend, your buddy? Uh -huh. Meet your friends. By the way, if they're not within your organization, yeah, you might wanna, if, does anybody need some paper? Because uh, uh, they have some here in the back, they have some pencils and things. All right, it's, it's helpful if you don't know your partner because then that's gonna naturally, you know, expand the conversation, think a little differently. All right, so like I said, normally this is like a two-day activity. So I'm gonna try to really, you know, condense it a lot. Okay, so <laughs> bear with me. All right. Yeah. All right, so the f in these um, first couple minutes here, I'm gonna give you two minutes to talk to your partner in crime, and you're going to decide what problem you're going to brainstorm on right now, okay? So you got two minutes. Let's go. Okay, I lied, you're only gonna get a minute. Who doesn't have a problem yet? <laughs> All right, good. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next one because uh, we're running a little late. Okay. So the next step is who who is the most affected by this problem, right? And if, uh, let's try to pick somebody who is underserved, somebody who doesn't currently have easy access to a solution. All right, you're gonna have a minute to discuss this. Who is most affected by the problem you just said? And if it's everybody, pick a segment.
And then once you know that, tell me why they're the most affected. Okay, next step in the conversation. What would it look like if the problem was solved in 15 years? If this problem didn't exist anymore in 15 years, what would that person's life be like? You have another minute. Okay, next question. And maybe it's too early to do this, but <laughs> what technology or trend discussed at this summit would help you to accomplish the goal of solving that problem within the next 15 years? And I know you've only heard about like one technology so far, so. Next question, what does that technology or trend allow you to do that was not possible before? That was not possible before. Does that make sense? Oftentimes, when we go to this point, we talk about the implications of that technology on the world, not just on your problem. Okay, last question in this sequence. If you were going to solve that problem using that technology or trend, what is the first thing you need to do or learn in order to start yourself along that trajectory? Thinking about the fact that Made in Space needed to start by putting a 3D printer on the International Space Station, right? What kind of thing do you need to learn or do? Go ahead.
Okay. I'm encouraged by the amount of conversation happening here. I hope it continues outside of this room. But basically what we've just done is a very shortened experiment on how we normally do this in the world. Okay? So what we do is we look at the problem. We try to spend as much time as possible trying to figure out what the real problem is. We fast forward into the future and we use 15 years in particular because it's far enough out that nobody can tell you for sure one way or another if it's going to happen. Nobody knows. And if they do tell you they know, they're lying. And then what we do is we say, okay, if that person were to live in that world, what would it be like? What would it be like to live there? And then we say, great, that's the future we want to create. Let's look at all the pieces. Does it need regulation? Does it need engineering? Does it need a piece of technology that doesn't exist yet? What does it need so that we can go and start to build that today? So hopefully you will use this kind of thinking to allow yourselves to imagine entirely new trajectories so that you can be the disruptor, not the disruptee. Thank you so much for your time.